May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with each one of us. Welcome to Cram and Kirk. Our pattern here is to stand as God's Word enters the sanctuary. If you're able, I invite you to stand with me now. Welcome to Cram and Kirk. A very warm welcome for all who are here for Holly's baptism. We hope you enjoy this service and participate in it and then enjoy the reception afterwards in the halls. Welcome to those watching from home and welcome to the Cram and Kirk congregation. All are welcome. The notices are printed here, but for those watching at home, I'll draw attention to next Sunday's 10 a.m. service is to mark love and loss, and we'll be remembering those who've lost a loved one and are still grieving. Bible study is on on Wednesday, looking at the Psalms. Christmas fair notice is now given, and there will be a Christmas tree festival this year. More details to come. The Mountain Men having their folk concert on Thursday night. All welcome to that. You have to buy tickets, though. Baptism today is Holly Kim, and we're looking forward to it. Sadly, a death, Marion Gracie, and Marion is not having a funeral service, but we send our condolences and our flowers today to the family, and the flowers were gifted by Jean Patterson. These are all the intimations. Most of the service will come up on the screen, including our call to worship. So let us Worship God. How I love your temple, Lord Almighty. How I want to be there. I long to be in the Lord's temple with my whole being. I sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrows have built a nest, and the swallows have their own home. They keep their young near your altars. Lord Almighty, my King and my God. How happy are those who live in your temple, always singing praises to you. Let us continue to worship God by singing that same psalm. It's in the hymn book at hymn number 52. How lovely is thy dwelling place.
Let us approach God with confidence. Let us pray together. Please be seated. Lord, God of the ordinary and the extraordinary, in a world where change is constant, though not, not always progressive, where awful things happen and power is abused, it is hard sometimes to see beyond it all and to sing your praise for the blessings we have. We persist, though, because you have promised to love us in our confusion, to come to meet us in the silence or in the surprising moments of joy, in the quiet comfort of friendship, in the colours of autumn. With the church around the world this morning, we join our voices together in praise. Forgive us for the times this week we have not done our best, when we have struggled to say the right thing or go the extra mile, when we have looked down on others, in this worship, lift our spirits to be prepared afresh to share your love with everyone we meet. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We now turn our attention to baptism through which we become full members of the body of Christ. And today it's our pleasure to welcome Holly Kim Kendrick. I don't know, you, some of you haven't been to Cram and Kirk before, but one of the things I try to do is if the children are willing, is that we bring the baptismal water in a big jug. And I'm always looking for somebody to help me pour it in here. Would you be willing to do that? It would be really nice if you did. <laughs> I can make a mess on my own. People here witness that week by week. But um, if you're willing to help, it would be even better. Can I persuade you? <laughs> what do you think? Okay. It's a deal. You see, in water, we have to have a congregation. In baptism, we have to have a congregation, we have to have a baby, and we have to have some water. I think your dad could help you with this. I think that would be just great. Make as much splash as you want, and it's all to go in there. This is good. Can you listen to yeah, all of it? And it's warm. You put your hand in there. It's nice and warm. You see, we've been thinking ahead here, planning. Thank you very much indeed. That was splendid. And it's good to have everybody involved. So, the important questions come to the parents and the godparent. I'm going to ask you those in a minute. But some people brought children to Jesus for Jesus to bless them, and the disciples scolded the people and turned them away. And Jesus said, don't turn away the children, let them come to me. Because to enter the kingdom of God, you have to be like a child, innocent, open, encouraged, curious. And so he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on each of them, and blessed them. So in this service, we're going to offer God's blessing and the baptism of the Jesus Christ at, the, at this service. So I'd invite you to stand, please, the three of you, and two questions to ask. Did you present Holly to be baptized, desiring that she may be a member of the church? Do you promise to bring her up in the life and worship of the church? Do. Do you promise, following Jesus' commandment, to teach her the truths and duties of the Christian faith? I do. And do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Excellent. I invite you to come forward. Would you like to carry Holly forward? That would be great. And we're going to come over here to the font. and face the congregation. Excellent. I've got the nice warm water now. So, Holly Kim Kendrick, I baptize you in the name of the Father 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you from this day and forevermore. The tradition here is that we ask the congregation to sing in response. But first of all, the godparents and the congregation have an important question to ask. Do you, will you follow your commitment to be members of the Church of Jesus Christ so that Holly and all children in our midst may grow up in the knowledge of Jesus? If you accept this responsibility, please stand. And now we're going to sing the ancient doxology, the Lord bless you and keep you. to Christ's commandment, Holly is now received into membership of the one holy, Catholic, or universal church, and is engaged to confess the faith of Jesus crucified and risen, and to be a faithful disciple until the end of her life. Ask the congregation to be seated as I pass over these gifts. So that's to remember, and that's the certificate of baptism. Please be seated, and I'll bring our prayers. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for receiving Holly into the Christian faith. Keep her always in your love. Grant that she will go strong in body, mind, and spirit. Protect her from all dangers. We ask your blessing on her parents and all parents, and of course, her godparents this day. Help us all to surround children with love and security. We commend to you this home and all the families who have gathered this day. Accept us as we recall our own baptism and rededicate ourselves to you and help us to care for all who are with us in the life of your church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and friend, Amen. We have a particularly lively baptismal hymn today for you. We're going to sing it through twice because it's so joyful and it comes from another part of the world. Simon will play and the words will come onto the screen. be seated. We have Sunday groups if the older children would like to go to those. There's also a creche at the back at the side here if any of the small children would like that as 
a means of support if they got upset. So these are available now if you would like to go. Michael. Let us hear the word of God. The first reading is taken from the New Testament, St. Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, and reading from verse 6. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and that all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack, and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory for ever and ever. Amen. The second reading is taken from the New Testament, St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, and reading from verse 9. 
He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified, rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves shall be exalted. May God bless to us the reading and hearing of his holy word, and to his name be all glory and praise. Amen. Occasionally, when they're printing a hymn, they make a misprint. The hymn we're about to sing had a misprint. The hymn title is There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. The misprint was There's a Wildness in God's Mercy. I hope in this sermon you'll begin to see a wee bit of the wildness of God's mercy. It's hymn 187. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The three key words in this sermon are grace, mercy, and peace. The people I've met in life, no matter what they're doing, are seeking to find peace, a deep peace within themselves and with their neighbors. That's what they're attempting, even if they go about it in some strange ways. Mercy, the second word, is about compassion, benevolence, forgiveness, kindly forbearance. And the first word is grace, and I'm going to say more about that. But these words, grace, mercy, and peace, you can apply them to celebrities, sports stars, church leaders, politicians. But I will let you make the connections for yourself. This story is an authentic, powerful gospel story. Jesus, our Lord, told this parable, this is what the Bible says, to some who trusted in themselves 
that they were righteous and who regarded others with contempt. That's what this parable is about. It's about turning around the way we look at others. And the key word is the word grace. The unbuyable, unpredictable, uncalculated, seemingly indiscriminate generosity of God even to the most despicable characters. Don't gloss over that fact. I did just say despicable characters. In the parable, the tax collector is not painted as Mr. Nice Guy. He is a rogue. Our common word for tax collectors was traitors. They collected taxes for an occupying army, and they were hated for good reason. They were supported by the broadswords of the Roman military. They enforced the payment of tolls even to the poorest of people, and they made an extortionate amount of money from their business. The tax man at the back of the temple had been a vampire, a blood-sucking creep. How do you picture him? How would you relate to him? On the other hand, the Pharisee presents himself as a good man. I see him as being lean from fasting often. He's desperately trying to do the right thing. Jews only had to fast one day of the year. This chap is voluntarily doing it twice a week. What is more, not only does he give a tenth of his income to God, which is what was recommended, he gives a tenth of every single thing he buys, just in case the shopkeeper doesn't tithe on his income. This is not one of the religious chaps who is legalistic and who only is concerned with himself. The man is generous. So the question comes, which one would you rather have as the new member of Cram and Kirk? Now be honest, which one would you rather have as the new member of Cram and Kirk? Okay. Where does the Pharisee go wrong? And where does the tax collector get it right? Because he's commended at the end of this parable. Look at the phrase which describes the Pharisee praying. The Pharisee prayed with himself like this. Prayed with himself. He is airing his goodness before God rather than communing with God who has made everything. He is flaunting his own virtues instead of appreciating the goodness of God in the creation and in his life. And things get worse. He moves on from there. He goes totally wrong when he attempts to justify himself by making comparisons with others. I thank you, God, that I am not like other men. And believe me, he also had a prayer for women. He attempts to find security by establishing his credentials by comparing the poorer credentials of extortioners, the unjust, the adulterers, and this tax collector. We have all heard people take that stance. Perhaps we've taken it ourselves. You read in the news, what's happened to some so-called respectable person and we hear ourselves say or others say, oh, I know I'm not a saint, but I'm not like that. We don't end vouchers by bad-mouthing others or gossiping. The only justification for being in the presence of God comes down to this, God's unconditional love for us. We are here on this planet because want, God wants us to be here, and we call it grace. The tax collector was a despicable man. He did have a despicable trade. He knew it. 
and he looked for nothing but mercy from God. He knew he had no right to be in the temple. He was aware that any comparison with others would leave him in embarrassment. His only feeling was that if God granted him free grace, then he would be okay and he was going to come humbly before God and honestly before God, describing who he was. And isn't that the essence of the thing? Self-vindication leads to a terrible poverty. Yes, for sports stars. Yes, for celebrities. Yes, for politicians. Yes, for thee and me. If we justify ourselves, we receive no grace because we don't leave room for it. Morally, we may be living exemplary lives, neatly packed, but self-justifications leave no cavity for the grace of God to take hold. One of the Australian hymn writers has a way of writing limericks, and he's written one about this particular parable. He says, there was a man in the middle who feared that faith was a fiddle, but to his great joy, he met with Mary's boy, and he found the key to the riddle. If we connect with Jesus Christ, we will find that self-justification does not bring peace. It does not guarantee mercy. We've got to understand Jesus wants us to see ourselves and our world in a different way. His values are different. That's challenging and important. There is a wildness in God's mercy. So may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and yours this day and forever. Amen.
There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in his justice, which is more than liberty. And so we turn to God and we bring our gifts, our time and our talents and our money now. And we stand and sing the doxology. The Lord bless you and keep you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. The words will be on the screen. be seated. We each bring our own prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray together. Loving God, we bring to you our gifts of talent and time and money. We are blessed that we can worship in peace and safety. We pray for Christians who cannot especially in China, Egypt, and Iran. Give comfort and strength to those who try to make peace and justice and to turn the hearts and minds of those who work against them to good, not evil. We pray for our own leaders in the United Kingdom, especially at this time of turmoil and global concern, when wise leadership is so necessary. Help whoever is chosen to see beyond personal gain and immediate concerns and let our new Prime Minister serve the whole community for its long-term benefit. We pray for our joint work with your church here in Cramond alongside our partners in Black Hall, Davidson's Mains, Drylaw, West Pilton and Muir House. For all those who try to fill the gaps and give hope in dark places, we ask your blessing on the schools, all medical staff, pharmacists, social workers, police, and firemen and women. Here in our own church family, we pray for all in hospital, those struggling in body, mind, or spirit, May they know the comfort and gentle touch of your love, the love that calls us by our names and says, you are mine. Around us here are things that remind us of the people of the past who have worshipped and worked here. In a moment of silence, we remember those we love who are now at one with you in heaven. God of light and love, you created us for both joy and suffering. You came into the world as our brother. You live with us in the spirit, the comforter. Be with us in our speaking and thinking this week as we pray Jesus' prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before our final hymn, I remind people that at the end of the service, they can go down to the halls and have teas and coffees, but there is a congregational meeting 
when we're going to give you an update, Ian Adam is going to speak about what's been happening since we last met in terms of the presbytery plan. So those who would like to, please stay in church. You can hear Ian's report and then ask your questions and then we will go down for teas and coffees. For those who want to get away quickly, I'll meet you at the door and come back in in five minutes. Let us conclude our service by singing the great hymn by John Bunyan, Who would true valour see? Let him come hither. It's hymn number 535. Now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with us from this day and remain with us forevermore. <laughs>